This is a Vox AC15 Custom 1, the C1, not the C1X. It's got a green back, not the blue. And this amp, this model, is one of my four finalists in the amps available under $500 video. It will also still be, along with its big brother, the AC30 Custom, a strong contender in the amps under $1,000 video. You can get these new just under a thousand, I think like seven, eight hundred dollars, seven hundred. You can get them used just under five. Uh, the Big Brother AC30, you can get them new, I think just under a thousand or right over and used from about six hundred to nine hundred. And they're very good choices. Let's see how well this particular amp holds up versus my recommendation. Is my recommendation right? So this amp came in because it had one problem. It actually has two. They're both minor. I'll show how to fix that. And the owner wanted some upgrades. So I'm going to do one video, this video, on showing this stock amp, its strengths and weaknesses, and how to fix the two issues that it has. And then later, when I do the upgrades, we'll talk about that. The upgrades are going to be making it more like the JMI model and changing out for a Alnico Blue speaker the owner's preference, but in stock form, the amp sounds quite nice. Now, of the two problems it came in for, or actually came in with, it, the uh, problem the owner knew about was the normal channel. We'll get to that. The reverb channel, hear that buzz? Something's amiss in that reverb tank. That's going to be the tank, not the amp itself. And that can happen with almost any amplifier of any price range. Reverb tanks are relatively fragile little beasts. As I'll show you in more detail in just a moment, the input jack for the normal channel is missing its dress washer and nut. It didn't break, it just came out. That's the kind of thing if you check you know, your, your gear every month, just to make sure things like that stay tight, it's less likely to happen. But the normal channel, I can hear the hiss from it, but there's no guitar signal. So we'll look at that. That could be a number of very minor things. It could just be a bad tube in V1. And the uh, top boost channel, the brilliant channel, is a little bit hissier than I'd like. I suspect that, all right, Phil Vester. I, su I suspect that's a preamp tube. We will find out in just a moment. But, you know, aside from that little beetle thing that everyone knows and loves, you can use this on a country gig, you can use this on a jazz gig, you can use it on a blues gig. higher gain than that, which we'll get into later, but I have the mic preset to a certain level to, because I knew I was going to be doing mostly clean and semi-clean here. So we move this to the bench. We'll take it apart, take a look at everything, and go through the insides of this amp that I told everyone was good. Let's see if you agree. Let's start with the missing hardware on this normal jack. It's a cliff style jack. If you have an 11 millimeter wrench, uh, socket rather, that's how you tighten these up most of the time don't have to over tighten it just make sure it can't move if you do that this will never happen they're not always tight from the factory um, that's pretty much the case for anything in this price range up to pretty much about two thousand dollars unless you're talking about a used amp that used to be over two thousand uh, dollars attention to detail sadly some of that we've got to do ourselves and i like to take the knobs off and make sure that those pots are tight too I think that might be a 10 millimeter. Let's see, that's a 10 millimeter. So let me change out. And yeah, I probably have more bits and pieces of hardware than the average person. But if you own one of these and you know that, hey, I need a 11 millimeter for that. And I need a 10 millimeter for that. Wrench itself is pretty universal. Just get a couple of sockets that fit. Maybe once a year, make sure everything's working right. These knobs are push-ons, so there's minimum. I'll refine that. I got it a little bit off, but we'll revisit that in a little bit. We go to the other side, the other end of things. Down here, the 
power and standby switches. Unlike other Voxes which use tube rectifiers, the Custom Series has a solid state rectification circuit. You should use the standby function because it has uh, filter caps which are right on the cusp of being able to handle the unloaded B plus before the tubes start uh, uh, drawing current, at which point they're fine. There's no issue with stripping tubes or damaging tubes uh, without using standby, uh, aside from the cathode follower stage, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But you know, if you have one of these powered on, wait a minute, take, you know, I had it in, you know, sorry, I had it backwards because I'm looking at it upside down. Power it on, wait a minute, take it out of standby, you're good to go. With other AC30s and AC15s that have a tube rectifier, you can just leave the standby switch in the on position at all times. Just use off on for the power, especially if you have the older AC30 Custom Classic where they switched the HT center tap with a standby, which gives a huge inrush of current to the GZ34 rectifier. It kills GZ34 rectifiers and is absolutely not beneficial to use at all. But in these which have solid state rectifiers, more on that in a little bit, do use it just to protect the caps. Um, I guess I'll discuss the cathode follower thing. If you have an amp which has a cathode follower stage, that's most boxes, uh, the, cust uh, the AC30 and AC some AC15s. Some of them have it plate driven rather than cathode follower. But most Marshalls, most boxes, the Tweed Baseman, the Tweed Twin, the tone stack is driven by what's called a cathode follower stage. And that has the grid directly applied, uh, direct, that has the grid of one triode directly connected to the plate of the previous triode. And until that tube is warmed up and the grid and cathode can do their little balancing act, you don't want to have full B plus present at that grid, which means that until the whole tube is warmed up and is drawing current, any high voltage present at its grid, which is tied to the plate connection of the previous tube stage, can, uh, can, can cause bad news for a cathode follower. Side note, if you have an amp with cathode follower, such as this, or a Marshall Super Lead, or a Tweed Baseman, avoid Russian tubes, uh, preamp tubes, for the cathode follower stage. In this amp, it's V2. For some reason, the cathode, uh, the high voltage on the cathode in a cathode follower stage makes all current production Russian tubes very unhappy. Uh, go with the Slovakian JJ, go with uh, various you know, good choices of Chinese made tube, or sort out a new old stock, you know, seek out a new old stock um, just for longevity. But that is an issue that you should be aware of. Something which bugs me about this amp, but it bugs me about a lot of amps made today, I think it's the same set of regulations that require the addition of that tube cage to the Fender reissue series so people can't burn their hands. They have these large panels and you can't just reach inside to change a tube. You gotta take the whole thing off to get to it. So if that's some safety regulation, it's hard to blame the manufacturers and that's Marshall, that's Vox, that's Blackstar, that's just about everyone in this price range. They don't want you to burn your little fingers. So this whole thing has to come off before we can see the inside and it has a lot of screws. The important thing to note is that this one you can barely see, and this one are wood screws, and this one's a wood screw, and I think this one might be a wood screw. Let's see, is that it's a wood screw machine? Most of these are machine screws. At least two are wood screws, and they are very different. Let's see here. All right, that's a machine screw. I'll show you the difference in a minute. Let's take the wood screws out first. People bring their amps in to me, and they'll have tried to fit a wood screw where a machine screw goes and vice versa. Let me get this machine screw out to show you the difference. Number one, a machine screw is not pointy and has very fine threads. A wood screw is pointy and has very coarse threads. If I try to put this wood screw into the machine screw uh, location, the little nut inside on the, on the chassis that receives a machine screw will just get destroyed and the screw gets destroyed. Meanwhile, if I try to stick a machine screw to where a wood screw ought to go, it doesn't grab the wood, doesn't grab the, you know, secure. So when you have one of these and you take it apart, find all your wood screws, put them in one bowl, 
put all the machine screws in a different bowl. And if you need to like take pictures or make notes or put little bits of tape and write where things are, whatever it takes so you don't mess it up. Let me get the rest of these screws off and then we'll dive in. One eternity later. All right, so all the screws are off the back panel and it doesn't want to come off. So just like on the Hot Rod series, there are two screws on each side which hold the chassis to the cab from the outside. And they are number three, so I'm not going to use this number two bit for that. And you want to just slightly loosen these. Just back them off a little bit. You can hear the wood shift. These are tight enough, which is good, that it compresses the side of the cab in that way. It does it on both sides and it just clamps the sides of this rear panel. So if I were to try to pull the rear panel off without loosening these screws just a little bit, wood can break or it can be very difficult and you'll be cussing life. It still can be a little bit tricky because like a lot of amp manufacturers, they put these panels on sometimes before every little bit of adhesive is dried. I still got some clamping action over here. Now I'm not removing these side screws. I want to keep the chassis in the cabinet, at least for right now. It's not going to fall. I'm just easing the pressure on the sides of the cab. And that wood can remember where it wants to be, so it can still be a little bit of pressure, but it's, it's coming. I wish this gap right down here, I wish this gap was half an inch thicker. I can't get my fingers in there. And I don't want to use a tool if I can avoid it, because that can damage things. Let's see, I've got, I've got a little knob puller that looks like it might be great for this. Uh, yeah, I'm hearing adhesive. That's what that sound is. That's what that resistance is. All right, so they've got this little bit of foamy stuff all over here to dampen this so this doesn't vibrate. And it was just adhering just a little bit, made it really hard to, to get. Let me put this carefully to the side, and then we'll take a look at the insides of this amp. For those of you already seeing the big scary PCB, more on that in just a moment. So yeah, it's PCB. Just about every amp in this price range is PCB. The days of the uh, Silver Face Princeton for $300 are gone. Responding to some of my Canadian commenters in the previous amps under 500 video, uh, the days of trainers under 500, the good trainers, there are a lot of different models, more on that to come, uh, but there are a lot of bad models too. I looked, they're gonna be in the next video, but they're under a thousand, but they're well over 500 and they often need quite a bit of work. So unless you just win the lottery, you're not gonna find a lot of hand-wired, non-PCB amps of any good quality and reliability in the price range under a thousand, typically. You might find a VibroChamp, uh, needs a little bit of work, but you know, let's not split hairs. But within the world of PCB amps, there are varying levels of quality. This is actually a high quality PCB. It's thick boards. It's plated on both sides with pretty good amount of copper. It's through hole. All the plating goes through the holes. It's very well made. It's reliable. It's not really prone to any major issues. And uh, it has four PCBs. Well, five. There's one for the input jacks. More on that in a moment. This main board that has the majority of the preamp stuff on it and all the op-amp circuitry, which is quite good. Uh, this is not a tube screamer stuck inside your amp. This is like uh, mixing console stuff. I'll just leave it at that for now. You've got the preamp board, the power amp board, and there's a little bitty board here for the foot switch. And on the Big Brother AC30, it also has effects loops. And uh, there's one more board, sorry. It's on the output jacks, no big deal. That just makes it easier to assemble at this price point. So in a minute, we're gonna take a look at the reverb tank and the input jacks because that's one, I know there's a problem with the reverb and the input jack might be uh, contributing to the issue with the normal channel not having signal, but it could also be just a bad tube in V1. But first I'm gonna talk about the lack of a tube rectifier. Neither the AC3015 Custom nor the AC30 Custom have a tube rectifier or a choke. They're using a resistor in place of the choke, 
which makes sense at this price range. There is not room to add a choke. If you do add a choke, I mean, I could squeeze one in, it's not really needed, It'd be an unnecessary cost. You would need to change the filtering, decrease the filtering, because it does not have a choke, it just has a resistor. Um, they've uh, increased the filter caps value, which offsets the need for a choke. And as far as a tube rectifier, people are asking a lot, can you add one to this? I could, you wouldn't want to pay the bill. I'd have to change the power transformer because this one does not have a five volt winding for said uh, tube rectifier. Neither is a really a good way to add one without a lot of expense to the chassis. And it doesn't really need one. They've got a very good solid state emulation of a, G of a GZ34 in these amps. And they've got some resistors which drop the voltage the right amount and provide the you know, quote unquote sag that a tube rectifier gives. They're making this to meet a certain price point. And if it had a choke, if it had a tube rectifier, the price would go quite up and this amp would not meet the needs it was designed for, for the market. Now that said, the lack of a tube rectifier can be a good thing because the primary thing that fails in amps which have tube rectifiers are the rectifier tubes. So a very well implemented, and this is solid state rectification circuit with the emulation of a tube rectifier as far as the voltage drop in SAG goes, makes a lot of sense. And I don't expect people are gonna have much issue with that down the line. Let's take a look at the input jack stuff. All right, I'm uns unscrewing the one which is remaining and take a note that the PCB faces that way and the back of the jack goes this way. These amps have these little metal rings, which are supposed to make contact with the chassis. And if they are loose because they're missing a jack, for instance, as this one is, sometimes it does not make contact and you have weird signal to noise ratio or sometimes no signals. So what I'm gonna do real fast, just as a quick test, is I'm gonna put this back in place with the hardware securing the normal side and we're going to see if the normal channel suddenly has signal, in which case the top boost might lose signal. Now, I would normally just replace the mounting hardware because I happen to have a lot of the necessary bits and pieces. And where did I put? I just had the socket right in front of me. Oh, it's right here. Duh, I still do. So I have these dress nuts. I have these washers. And if this were just going to be a repair, I put a new dress nut and washer on. I'm actually going to be doing a few upgrades to this amp, including replacing the input jacks, uh, just due to a personal preference. Uh, it'll be the same look on the outside. I'm not putting Switchcraft in. I want that isolation, but I like the uh, reliability of a Neutrik or a Cliff better than the ones that they use. Let me power this up and we'll see if moving that hardware fixes the normal channel. Okay, it's been powered on for a minute, taken out of standby. Lower the volume on the top boost channel and the normal channel. Here in the tremolo, I turn those knobs and the reverb while I was getting things set up here. So we have that there. I'm gonna have the master volume about noon so we don't blow out the lav mic. Plug into the normal channel and see if we have signal now. Yeah. If I go into the top boost channel now, we may or may not have signal. It may take a while for that problem uh, for the jack to get loose enough and see the problem is moved to the top boost channel. And if I were, I'm going to do this on camera because I know what voltages are and are not on this board and there are no voltages, but this is a live amp. So do not reach into one of these unless you know exactly what's where. All right, now I have no still have no signal even though I press real hard. Isn't that fun? It may be, oh, I know what it is, duh. All right, Lyle, sometimes you're just so damn smart it hurts. I've got a, a grounding, a shorting plug on this cable. And because that nut's not there, it's not uh, unshorting. So if I change to a different guitar cable, dang it, Bobby.
So my earlier diagnosis was not in fact correct because I forgot that I was using a shorting cable, which was not unshorting because of the lack of the nut. That said, I have encountered a lot of this series and the Custom Classic series where if that connection is not tight, that metal ring uh, is not pressed up against the metal chassis or corrosion builds up, you can have the signal cut out and uh, you get a lot of static and RFI. So now we're going to check the tubes and the reverb tank. All right, this amp has four tubes. It has two EL84s, three 12 X7s. This one's underneath the tube shield. It's always fun getting these off. All right, let's turn the volumes up on both channels a little bit. A little bit more white noise than I'd like. This one's just slightly microphonic. And hear it when I tap on it. So let's put it in standby for just a moment. I'm going to pull this tube and see what it is. It's very stiff in the base. They use very good quality tube sockets in these. They're ceramic. The issue is that the uh, base of, that holds the tube shield has an opening of a fixed diameter and some current production tubes this may be a russian one are a real tight squeeze in that and you run into that on a lot of apps including the old ones let me move the camera to the side i just can't get any leverage it looks like a tongue saw which is russian okay i got it out indeed it was a russian tongue saw which is a very hard fit a very tight squeeze into most two bases these days, but it can work. You just have to line it up very carefully before you press. V2 is also a tongue saw 12AX7. So I'm going to take it out and move it to V1 in hopes that it's not microphonic. And I'm gonna put a generic Chinese tube for now in V2 because this is a cathode follower stage and that can kill this tongue saw and tube prices are going crazy these days. Now notice on these, they've got this little bit of heat shrink here holding it in place. Try not to lose those when you change tubes. And I did this backwards. Much easier to pull the tongue saw out when it doesn't have that tube base. I'll go back in the same orientation here. So moving the one that was in V2 to V1. And we're gonna put this Chinese tube temporarily in V2. I ordered him a better one than this little generic. And that microphonic 12X7 might be a good backup for the phase inverter where microphonics are less of an issue. So I'm going to put this back in place and I'll slide this little thing back on here. Sometimes it goes back on, sometimes it doesn't like to, in which case I'll put it to the side. And then when I get the real tube installed, I'll put a new bit of, I'll do that now. Put this to the side. I just snip a little bit of heat shrink and do the same thing fresh because each tube's glass uh, nozzle, you know, the little ice cream tip is slightly different. So let's see, microphonics now. No. So, so far, Damp's problems are a missing nut on the input jack, slightly microphonic tube, and uh, the, no the white noise has gone down a little bit. So let's look at the reverb tank. All right, it is our friend, the Belton Accutronics, which typically don't sound very good. Uh, these tanks often fail. It's a I will remove it if necessary to confirm, but right now I've got another tank handy already. This is a Ruby branded tank and the suitable input and output impedance. This is a solid state reverb circuit. So it uses the E series, not the, the A series. You see there, RRV S3EB1C1B to three spring small tank tube. Let's see if the reverb noise goes away and we have a much stronger reverb as I suspect. We may get, may get a little bit of hum, but let's see. So if I bring the reverb level up, the hum and buzz is gone and <coughs> strong reverb. So let's uh, disconnect the new tank and I'm gonna remove this one and we'll take a look and see what's wrong. It may just be uh, a loose connection or a broken wire or something. We shall find out. All right. 
nothing has come disconnected. Everything was, you know, as it left the factory, it's just a piece of crap. And it uh, is not passing signal through this in input transducer. The output receives and it just sounds terrible. And uh, a good quality one's 25, 30 bucks. And uh, that's not really a slam so much against uh, Vox. Uh, Fender's using the same tanks and their amps. Same problems. I loathe the current production belt and Accutronics tanks, but when the solution is 20, 30 bucks and anyone can install it, if you know how to connect a stereo system with RCA cables, you know, it's not really a gotcha. So for right now I've got the uh, Ruby in and here's with reverb and trim. In just a minute, I'll put it back over at the real playing area and let you hear the normal and the top boost channel. Now that both channels are working, I'll use the proper cable. Actually, I'll probably put a, a new dress nut up there on that missing one just for right now. I do want to point out one other thing that can go wrong with these amps. Uh, it won't go wrong all the time. It's a very easy thing to change and fix if it does. All right, here we've got this 470 ohm one watt resistor. Here, another 470 ohm one watt resistor. These are the screen grid resistors. Fox traditionally used 100 ohm half watts. Uh, I am glad to see that they are approaching sanity by going to 470 ohms and going up to a one watt, but it is not what I would send out into the world. And these can fail, and when they do fail, they're mounted right up against this board, so if they burn, they'll make a little char in the board. You can get a little carbonization. So what I do, and I recommend you have it done if you buy one of these, because it would not cost much to do. You can do these this mod without pulling this board, is have a tech replace these one watt 470 ohm resistors with two or three watt 1Ks. You can go up to 2K without negatively affecting the sound, but 1K is a pretty good place to be. And just mount the new ones slightly over the board, maybe by the height of the tip of that pointer. So if one of those screen grid resistors were to fail, it would burn up in the air and would not burn the board. And because it's up in the air, it'll dissipate heat better. It's much less likely to burn to begin with. You'd have to have a really bad EL84 for that to happen. But you know, really bad EL84s are a fact of life most of the time, but they, they do occur. So anywho, let me put a dress nut on where it's missing on that uh, one input jack and get this set up for a real playing test. This is my third time to record this little bit of the video because each time I've gotten sidetracked into actually playing the amp as opposed to thinking about the video and telling you guys anything. I was just kind of chasing sounds and finding them. And that's probably one of the best reviews I could give an amplifier is that I forget to be analytical and I th forget what I'm doing and I just play the damn thing. But you know, there's just so many sounds available. Now I'm gonna start with the normal channel, which is frankly a little bit limited in the custom series. It and the custom classic, I don't know who at Vox or Korg did this, but they made the decision to emulate in most ways the normal channel from the treble version of the 60s AC30, which has a 330K resistor in series before the volume pot. And it's like having a volume pot that you can only turn up to seven. Uh, I don't like the sound of that circuit. It both neuters the uh, amount of gain available and it makes it a little bit artificially bright at all times. Uh, so that's one of the things I like to change about this. That said, I'll let you hear the, the stock uh, normal circuit. I got the uh, volume at 10 o'clock. I've got the tone cut at 11 o'clock. I've got the master volume all the way. It's about the level of a Princeton right now. It's not as full sounding as the uh, non-treble version of the, of the channel, but most people are gonna like this. The non-treble version of the channel can also be a bit dark and to some people a little bit boomy. So, you know, it is it is one of the historic flavors. I think it is the uh, the wimpiest and I change it in fact to be 
more like the actual input uh, response of the vintage AC15 when I do these, which means it has the gain of the non-treble version normal channel, the JMI did, but it has the uh, low end response of the AC15, which is not as boomy as the AC30 normal channel. Uh, so you get in between the two, but you know, it's not a bad stock form. And if you want to not, you know, it doesn't have all the lows it's big uh, as Vintage Brothers had, which can be good with a Les Paul. And if it doesn't have all the gain the channel potentially could have, it still has quite a bit. So let's put it up here about two o'clock. And you know, if you're a Chicago blues kind of fan, maybe turn it down a little bit. Let's go to closer to noon. I am not much of a blues player. If Bonamassa were sitting in this chair playing this guitar through this amp, you'd all want to go out and buy one and Vox would have to raise the prices. But you know, it's a, it's a volume and a global tone control. That's all that's active right now, plus that little bit of reverb. And it sounds really good. And then if you dime it, you really need a treble booster plus that that 330k resistor to be removed, but you're in familiar territory at least. Probably should have turned the reverb off for that. Anyway, I'm gonna move to the normal ch from the normal channel to the top boost brilliant channel, and. Uh, one other thing I want to mention at this point is uh, some things I forgot to do earlier. The main differences between the AC15 Custom and the AC30 Custom, besides the fact that the 30 has uh, four EL84s versus two in this, and therefore they have different output and power transformers, the rest of the circuit is pretty much the same, though the uh, AC15 emulates the rectification of the EZ81, the AC30 emulates the rectification of the GZ34. From the player's perspective, they are very similar. They have the same controls. Each channel does exactly the same thing. The AC15 only has two input jacks, has one for each channel. The AC30 has four input jacks, a high gain and a low gain for each channel, which means on the AC30, you can jumper the channels. You cannot on the AC15. And the AC30 also adds an effects loop, which the AC15 lacks. So if you need an effects loop, the AC30 is your, your choice. The AC30, I believe, can be had in a 2x12 or a 1x12 version. The uh, 2x12 is the more common. I think there were some 2x10 AC15 customs. I, don't quote me on that. This is a single 12, and there might be some 2x12s, but that's a lot of added weight. It's a very high quality cabinet. It is, however, plywood. It is high grade plywood, which means that it is heavy. It's a very heavy amp. It's heavier than the Deluxe Reverb, which is about the same size. If that's a factor for you, know that it is not a lightweight amp. Conversely, while the construction is real solid, the Tolex and grill cloth that Vox used is pretty fragile. The Tolex on the Vox is the same Tolex you find on a high watt, and it's very thin and can, they get damaged if you look at it too hard. So if you have one, you might want to baby it. The grill cloth is not as rugged as what you'd find on a Fender and Marshall. It will tear if you're not careful with it. it uh, it's just pressed into a little seam beneath this gold strip. If it gets pulled down, it'll sag. But to some others, that's part of the charm. It is a very funky thing that really shows it was designed in 1959. It's a cool looking thing for most people. If you don't want it to look all road worn and battered, baby it, a, a flight case would be recommended with wheels then you don't have to carry it, pick the damn thing up. You just wheel it up a ramp or whatever, and then you just take the outer case off. It sits in the shelf with the wheels. But that's enough yapping. Let's let's play this thing. So the bridge neck in the middle position, neck volume down just almost to eight. We've got the top boost channel volume at 10 o'clock, treble and bass about uh, two o'clock, tone cut still at 11, master still full up. Let's see if this thing does that thing that voxes are known to do.
It does. Uh, my crappy playing aside, it's that clean feedback thing. It doesn't have to be clean, but you know, if you play it softly, you get clean and it feeds back and sustains and the harmonics bloom. Same app setting if you dig in. People say boxes don't really need reverb. That's part of what they're talking about. That harmonic bloom, that series of overtones kind of fills it in, but you can add a little bit of reverb to that. We want to add a little tremolo to it. with the master on 10 it has a good master volume pretty good it's a it's a cross line from about 10 o'clock up it's pretty good you turn it way down i've got it like 8 30 now the phase inverter cleans up and the output tube cleans up too much but starting pretty much about 10 o'clock It will be your friend. It can be improved, but it, it doesn't suck in stock form. And uh, with the Les Paul, we haven't turned the uh, master over 10 o'clock, so I'll turn it up. I'm sorry, I haven't turned the top boost up. So I'll turn it about to one o'clock, put the master back on 10 because we can. And uh, maybe not quite up to one o'clock, just over noon. Do something a little bit cartoonish with the reverb up too much just to show that the tank very much works So this one's a little bit longer than uh, my choice If you turn the, the gain all the way up on the top boost channel, you're in silly heavy metal territory, or at least hard rock. So that's enough quiet riot for now. I mean, you need a four by 12 to really do that, but the circuit itself puts it out. So I'm gonna go find some more silly things to play off camera. <laughs> 